today we are answering a viewer question because Lee H asks us, why do we call pennies, nickels, and dimes those names? Prior to the United States minting their own coins, it relied on foreign currency. However, that all changed with the passing of the Coinage Act of 1792, which provided the framework for regulating money produced in the United States, as well as establishing the United States Mint. A little over a month after the passing of the Coinage Act, an act to provide for a copper coinage was signed into law, and the first official U.S. minted currency was slated to be created. Among the forms of currency to make up the U.S. monetary system was the copper cent and the half cent, first being minted in 1793. Besides being called that name, the cent also retains the name Penny, borrowed from the name for Britain's Penny, which had previously been commonly circulated in the country. As for the British Penny, it is thought to have got its name from the Old English word Penning, which in turn is thought to derive from the German Fenning. As for the nickel, this term has not always been the name for the United States five cent coin. You see, the half dime, which is actually spelled D I S M E, but is pronounced dime, as it was originally referred to, it wasn't made of nickel. Like the ten cent coin, the half dime was made of silver and weighed exactly half of the dime, hence half the value. During the Civil War, many metals were needed to support war efforts, resulting in the majority of coins going out of circulation, including the half dime. After the war, a new type of five cent piece was introduced, one made of of a copper and nickel alloy rather than silver. It wasn't until 1883, after intense lobbying efforts by industrialist Joseph Wharton, that the nickel alloy caught on, replacing the half dime and becoming widely circulated as the nickel, named after the metal by which it was made. So, moving on to the dime. This was technically the first coin made by the US Mint, but, but they were using a borrowed coin machine and this was four years before a mint building was constructed. However, this dime was not circulated, and the first dime produced by the mint to be used by the public wasn't actually produced until 1796. As for the name, dime ultimately derives from the Latin word decimus, which means one-tenth. The term dime with the S was used by the French to indicate a monetary value of a tenth, and eventually the S in that word was dropped and it just became dime. Following suit with the dime, the quarter, which was first produced by the mint in 1796, received its name to indicate its monetary worth as a quarter of a dollar. This was a slightly unusual choice, as using one-fifth denomination was more common in many currencies. However, at the time, the Spanish dollar or peso, equal to six reals, thus pieces of eight, was widely circulated in the United States. In large part due to this, and perhaps further thumbing their noses a bit at the British, the US chose to design the US dollar to duplicate the Spanish coins in terms of matching the material and weight, and hence the value. At the time, coins were made of silver and valued after the price of the silver. Doing this allowed the US coin to be exchanged for the widely circulated Spanish dollar in a one-to-one -one exchange, which was particularly beneficial for international trade and during the transition phase from foreign currencies to US minted currency. For example, due to shortages of gold and silver, the US was seamlessly able to extend legal tender status to the Spanish dollar in the late 18th century, something that wasn't taken away until the mid-19th century. Thus, a one-quarter denomination was chosen instead of a one-fifth to equal the Spanish rails, colloquially known as tubits, hence why an alternate name for the quarter in the United States was tubits. The name dollar derives from the word thaler, which is an abbreviation of the word Johinsthaler, a coin type made from silver mined in Bohemia that was first minted in 1519. Eventually, that mouthful of a name was just shortened to thaler, and most notably for the topic at hand, ultimately lent its name to the Spanish pieces of eight, also called the Spanish dollar. As the US dollar was modeled after the pieces of eight, it was natural enough to borrow dollar from the colloquial name for the Spanish currency. As for how the dollar ultimately became known as a buck, one of the earliest references of this was in 1748, about 44 years before the first US dollar was minted, where there is reference to the exchange rate for a cask of whiskey traded to Native Americans being five bucks, referring to deerskins. In yet another documented reference from 1748, Conrad Weiser, while traveling through present-day Ohio, noted in his journal that someone had been robbed of the value of 300 bucks. At this time, a buckskin was a common medium of exchange. There is also evidence that a buck didn't simply mean one deer skin, but may have meant multiple skins depending on quality. For instance, skins from a deer killed in the winter were considered superior to those killed in the summer due to the fur being thicker. 
It is thought that the highest quality skins were generally assigned a one to one value, with one skin equaling one buck. In contrast, for lower quality skins, it might take several of them to be valued at a single buck. The specific value for given sets of skins was then set at trading. In addition, when the skin was from another animal, the number of skins required to equal a buck varied depending on the animal and the quality of the skin. For instance, there is one documented trade where six high quality beaver skins or 12 high quality rabbit pelts each equaled one buck. The use of skins as a medium of exchange gradually died off over the next century as more and more Europeans moved in and built towns and cities. Once the US dollar was officially introduced after the passing of the Coinage Act of 1792, it quickly became the leading item used as a medium of exchange, but the term buck stuck around and by the mid-19th century it was being used as a slang term for the dollar. And now for some bonus facts. Ever wonder where the expression dollars to donuts comes from? Well, want to know more. Dollars for donuts, or alternatively, dollars to donuts, meaning a safe bet or sure thing, at least in its documented form in a February the 6th, 1876 edition of the Daily Nevada State Journal. It reads, Whenever you hear any resident of a community attempting to decry the local paper, it's dollars to donuts that such a person is either mad at the editor or is owing the office for subscription or advertising. It again appeared in that same newspaper a little over a month later on March the 11th, 1876, where it stated, Several Benoites took advantage of the half-fare tickets offered to those who were to attend the ball given by the railroad boys at Carson last night and attended it. It's dollars to donuts all enjoyed themselves. Given that the newspaper used the expression without explaining it or otherwise giving emphasis, it is likely the author felt that people would already be familiar with the phrase, so it had probably been around in slang for at least a few years up to this point, if not longer. As to why dollars to donuts beyond the alliterative qualities, it was essentially just a way to say that you'd bet dollars to something mostly worthless relative to the dollars, emphasizing how sure you are that you're correct. Going back to the 1840s, there was a very similar expression with the same basic meaning, and that's dollars to dimes. Two other similar expressions that existed in the 1880s are dollars to dumplings and dollars to buttons. A couple of decades later, dollars to cobwebs also popped up, but none of these had the staying power of dollars to donuts. In all cases, the latter thing is the worthless item relative to the value of the dollars. And now for another bonus fact. The original face of the US penny symbolized liberty in the form of a woman with flowing hair. It wasn't until 1909 that this image was replaced by the bust of Abraham Lincoln to commemorate the fallen president's 100th birthday. And now for another bonus fact. The Thomas Jefferson nickels were first minted in 1938. The design for these five cent pieces resulted from a contest held by the United States Mint, the reward being $1,000. Out of the 390 contestants, the winner with the best design was Felix Schlager, German immigrant who had only been a United States citizen for nine years. As part of his design for the Jefferson nickel, Felix Schlager chose to depict Thomas Jefferson's Virginia home, the Monticello. Jefferson designed the building himself, and construction took 55 years to complete. Unlike the design of the nickel, which was chosen as the result of a contest, the adverse design of the dime that we know today was an intentional act to honor President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his efforts with the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, or March of Dimes, which he established when he was stricken with polio in the 1920s. Wanting to do Roosevelt justice, engraver John R. Sinek was granted the honor of designing the dime due to how he captured President Roosevelt on a previous medal that he had worked on. The original designs of the diamond quarter did not include ridges around the circumference. Conference. When the United States started minting coins, these two coins were among those made with the precious metals, silver and gold. Individuals trying to beat the system for profit would file off the edges of the coins to later combine the metal dust to form additional coins. Even though these coins are now made with cheaper metals, the ridged circumferences are still used today. The quarter has 119 ridges and the dime has 118 ridges around its edge. And now for another bonus fact. Not wanting even the smallest suggestion of a tyrannical mindset to be associated with his presidency, George Washington refused the honor of having his visage on U.S. currency. Later on, the tradition that was born out of this became an actual federal law, stating not only that living presidents could not be featured on money, but that a president had to be dead for at least two years before his portrait could be printed on U.S. currency. And now for another bonus fact. The average life of most coins is 25 years, whereas the lifespan for the average dollar is only 18 months, leading some to push hard for a switch from paper dollars to coins, but there's been no real luck. When coins become too old and worn to be in circulation, the United States Mint recycles them, and any usable material from these coins is turned into coinage strips for new coins.
So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also, I've got another channel that you should definitely check out called Highlight History. Subscribe to that, subscribe to this channel as well. When you're subscribing, hit that bell icon so you actually find out when we put out a new video. That would be grand, and I'll see you next time.